OK, we're now recording. This is our second ever SourceGrid Office Hours. Uh, we have Brian, William, and Will, and myself in attendance. Uh, and we're just about to chat about some suggestions that Will made uh, for the, the project. Yeah, so uh, you can answer your email, right? But, um, yeah, so <clears throat> like I found a lot of different like already made solutions that a lot of people are using for kind of GraphQL um, overall like, architectures. Uh, kind of the, the main problem here is that um, when you have like a GraphQL schema, you have to then kind of translate that to like a relational database schema. And that can get a bit tricky. Um, there's some things out there that, uh, for example, there's this one like library framework called uh, Prisma, which essentially what it is is kind of like a like ORM layer on top of, uh, it's like a, a server that, translates uh, GraphQL queries into a, a like SQL queries, but also like a GraphQL schema into a like a relational database schema. So essentially you could just work with uh, like GraphQL queries and not have to touch SQL at all in that, that sense. Um, and this is a lot more like for the use case of um, like if you're trying to build uh, like a server API for that's like using GraphQL. And so for that, it's like some other sort of client pings um, this GraphQL endpoint, and then um, it has a lot of kind of pre-built uh, like functions and things that that handle like what happens when someone queries this uh, this endpoint and like what what they're actually looking for. But there's kind of like some like half solutions in between there that are like. Um, so there's like a GraphQL server, and there's like a GraphQL GraphQL client, and so um, what like replacing what we currently have would entail would be um, replace like putting a, a GraphQL client in the back end so that uh, it kind of mirrors the the uh, GraphQL endpoint that that GitHub has has. Um, yes, yeah, so any any questions, comments so far about? Um, some of that. Or, I didn't really understand the last part. You said the the back end would have a GraphQL client endpoint. What can you elaborate? Yeah, so this would be for um, just to have like a one to one mapping for uh, to to ping like other other GraphQL APIs. Um, so what I mean here is that like in order for like using something like this uh, or um like Prisma kind of of uh, Backend server, where like the the schema or like the database schema is made from the the GraphQL schema, you can literally just give it like the like GitHub's uh, GraphQL schema, and then it'll generate the database for it. But then you still have to kind of uh, ping the like the, the GraphQL API, and so then um, you would use uh, like a the, a client for that in the backend. But it, if you if you does that make sense or? I don't know. I, I still don't see how all the pieces fit together. Like, I I guess for me the the major thing the, or the major question that I have is that like the a lot of off the shelf GraphQL solutions and I haven't looked into all the ones that you're talking about, but something like Apollo, um, for instance, is meant to be used in the way that GraphQL is supposed to be used, which is that you like don't download the entire database. You query exactly what you want, and that kind of is the opposite of how our architecture is designed currently. So one thing moving forward that I could see us making a change for in our architecture is um, remove that assumption so that we don't, so that we can stream data from GraphQL in the way that GraphQL kind of wants you to do that. Um, and I guess the question that I have is, are, are these systems that you're talking about built on that GraphQL assumption or will they create a, a local mirror of the database that can have like, I, I, don't, I don't understand what the problem is that these databases are trying to solve or these systems. Um, I guess it's that, like, okay, if you're trying to build, like, a, a back-end GraphQL server, um, you have to kind of, like, take for, take into account how, how to kind of translate, that, like, queries and schemas into, like, a relational database kind of uh, SQL-type, like, queries. And so... Um, on one hand, that's kind of a little bit tough, but on the other hand, it's like trying to map the relations that like the GraphQL like graph kind of abstraction kind of does, but like map that then into a regular database. So, um, 
and what these do kind of is just give you like a lot of like pre-built like things for that. So you could like treat objects as objects and not have to do like, okay, query this from uh, GitHub and then translate this into an object and then like make this object uh, in the, like save that to the database via, like via SQL queries. Um, essentially like what this would do is uh, you have kind of, you define like the resolvers for the, the, the GitHub GraphQL API and uh, in those resolvers you can kind of determine like how, how, what do you do with this data, like how do you process it um yeah how much work would it be to get a, a like super minimal example of this working minimal but with like support for pagination yeah so i um on my i made a github repository um that kind of like it, it was based on this tutorial that i was going through kind of like the the full stack of uh, what all this entails so uh it's using uh i want to say it's like a Amazon Aurora database, which um, th the problem here is that like it, some of these, like the databases aren't quite supported. So you have to switch from SQLite to either MySQL or Postgres. And, um, but you can also do it in ways that are kind of like very like serverless kind of microservice oriented. Um, but yeah, so th this example that I had, it kind of goes from like Prisma, which is kind of this GraphQL query layer that translates the, the GraphQL queries into SQL queries and then like database entries. Then there's kind of this layer on top of it that's uh, like a GraphQL uh, Yoga, which is essentially like just a GraphQL server that is pretty much like the endpoint that you query that then goes to Prisma, that then goes to the database. And then this is kind of the what's exposed from the back end. And then from the front end, you use uh, Apollo as kind of a, a client and then um, React or whatever kind of front end language that you want. But you get a lot of kind of like features for free here where it's like you could then take advantage of GraphQL subscriptions where it's like uh, over WebSockets, you could just get kind of streaming updates for things. So for example, if you like subscribe to GitHub's like webhooks, um, this will just like push the, the updates into um, like from this, this back end to the database, the, the front end. So it's like this very kind of like reactive uh, serverless type like architecture. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I would be interested to see how this works and how it fits into our existing pipeline. Yeah, I'm like writing up some some markdown documents about kind of how like what these things are used for, how they how would they fit into kind of like what we currently have and like what we could like reuse from what we currently have into this this kind of structure, so. Yeah, I think that for me, just seeing a like working demo of the, the mirroring or like caching behavior, because uh, in my mind, uh, taking a library that like off the shelf is doing, abstracting over a lot of like, like yeah, you want to run a like front end that's backed by GraphQL. I imagine we would get a lot of useful features there. Uh, so it's just the thing that we're doing kind of uniquely, which is we do want to mirror out another GraphQL database. Uh, since that's weird, I would want to see if the technology is able to accommodate it. Um, yeah, and Will, you also had a bunch of suggestions about like, and it keeps on telling me I can't minimize Zoom when I'm recording the meeting. So I don't know if what's that going to do to the recording if I look at my GitHub. Uh, but I had a bunch of suggestions around like milestones and weekly progress reports. Uh, and this is actually, this is stuff that I've been thinking about for a while and particularly like the weekly progress reports. Uh, I think it'd be really, really cool to have. Uh, and it's just something that I haven't like, you know, had the bandwidth to like fully drive myself, I guess. Yeah, so one um, thing, I, I still have, like, a lot of issues to add that are currently kind of, like, not fully fleshed out, but in note form, but uh, some things I was going to, like, add was, uh, one would be to switch to kind of um, the, the current, like, repository that's, like, source code mission. Uh, I think we could either, like, mission sounds kind of, like, not what that's used for at the moment. Like, when I think of mission, I think of, like, okay, what values are driving the company, what kind of, like... Uh, intrinsic motivations are people like making this thing for um 
I, I kind of envision that more so as like a repository for like project management related things and like um, yeah, like IPFS has a really solid one. Uh, like Ethereum has like ones and kind of like the gist of what goes into these is kind of uh, it's like the main repo would have like a list of kind of like the, the like meetings, notes from the meetings. Um, like for example, like IPFS has a lot of templates for like, for example, like calls like this where like having parts of this for like the agenda for kind of like what things to bring up. Um, there's a lot of like structure that I think can be put in place around uh, those sorts of things. So. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. I, I do think, I think one idea I'm getting from this is that maybe our office hours notes, which uh, Brian has been doing a great job putting together, rather than just being issues, issues are kind of like hard to keep track of in the long term. Maybe we should just have like a folder there that's like office hours and it will just have uh, like for each one, it will have the notes along with a link to the YouTube uh, as a markdown document. Um, and I agree that source code slash mission is probably not the right name. It's, it's honestly, it's kind of more like source code slash logistics right now. Uh, but I'm happy to, you know, we can just rename GitHub repositories. I'm happy to hear uh, proposals for what it should actually be called. I, I was also thinking that it's basically logistics right now. So if two people think that that actually accurately describes what it's currently doing, maybe it's not a bad name. Right. Yeah, one thing I was also going to add is like <clears throat> something that would be cool would be like uh, search cred slash research where um, I think this would be a, a nice like in terms of organization to place kind of things that are more so like related to kind of, okay, wh what like open source project is doing. For example, uh, I can imagine like a section being something like case studies where it's like this was kind of spawned mm -hmm. by the, the discussion the other day about like, okay, IPFS uses kind of their releases for discussing like, okay, referencing all these issues that it fixed, something like that. Uh, kind of making like case studies for like what, like specific open source projects, oh. like each project is kind of its own like ecosystem of how it operates and, and works. And be nice to kind of like extrapolate kind of the, the design patterns of like what makes sort of like these open source communities like work well. Yeah, I, I like the idea of having a source cred slash research repository as well, uh, both because I mean, because of what you said, because I think it it would correctly communicate that like source cred has a large like research component of just trying to figure out how we can do a good job of credit attribution. Uh, it's like far from a solved problem. Um, and I've also been wanting a place to really like more rigorously document the algorithm and the areas of improvement for the algorithm. Uh, and I think source cred slash research could be a good place for that. So for documenting the algorithm and the areas of improvement, and I think maybe this ties into things like we want to have design docs for um, the like the weights problem and, and things like that. Right. What is the benefit to putting those in a separate repository rather than the, the main code repository? That's fair. I guess it's it's like, I kind of imagine that maybe we'd want to eventually have a smaller repo organization, but it's not clear that that's actually a good idea. Yeah, I, I like it's, it's a genuine question. I, I don't yeah. have a, a preconception. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair question. I don't have like a super like certain answer to that. I, I guess that's not true. I do have a preconception, which is don't make lots of new repos if you don't have a good reason to, um, but it's a weak preconception. Yeah, I, I do think that like if we're doing like case studies, then having it then put in a different repo makes sense. Uh, but I think that you're right that like the algorithm design stuff could just as easily be under source code, source code, since that's where the algorithm lives. Right. For instance, then if you change the algorithm, you can change the docs in the same commit. Right. Yeah, we don't actually have any case studies yet. Although I've been meaning to, I think it'd be really good to like start spinning up like a case, an IPFS case study where by IPFS case study, I kind of mean like, you know, we, we put our best foot forward in terms of running the current algorithm on IPFS, and then we actually go and like, like poke a bunch of IPFS people to provide feedback in a public forum so that we can like start to start to iterate from there. So like you, if, if we're going to do a, a case study on a, a certain repo, you, you need someone with like very, very deep knowledge of that repo in order to give us feedback, right? Right. Like we were the, we were the only people that would be capable of, understanding our own pull requests on source cred. And, right. Um, 
that's actually something I'm thinking about also in the, the algorithm itself for the application is how to solicit the opinions, I guess, of maybe people with lots of knowledge about the code base. Totally. Um, yeah, we had some thoughts about this previously, wherein like anyone for a repository could create their own attributions for the repository and put them in some well-known location. Like maybe you, you fork the repository and you add a branch called like dot attributions or something, I don't know. And then like those could be incorporated into the algorithm somehow. And they're like, they're interesting questions about how to do that. Um, like it, 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 there's, it, it makes the gaming resistance problem a little harder because now people can like directly um, have, yeah. have a say on what the global attribution should be. But I think there are ways that you can make it work. So it'd be interesting to discuss that. The, the other issue with that though too is like if you want to make maintainers lives easier you don't want to put more work on their plate right yeah so we had talked <laughs> about yeah no, that's absolutely true we had talked about having like uh, a chrome extension or something such yeah. when you're on an issue page you can click a button and it'll like automatically commit to your own repository an update yeah 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 yeah, some of the other ideas were like maybe we should have the ability for people in the community to propose new nodes in the graph uh, and so like an example of this is like right now, this, if we're just looking at source cred slash source cred, uh, the work that Brian is doing in producing the notes for these meetings isn't like getting cred properly. Uh, although in the repo of source cred slash mission, you do have that cred because you're getting like reference, you're making these posts that other people are thumbs upping and like you're getting like references and putting all of these issues, yeah. you know, thanks to Brian for making the notes. Uh, and so I think to an extent, actually, the, the idea of like manually having a plugin that lets you manually add nodes to the graph or edges to the graph saying like, you know, valuing X, Y, and Z uh, has kind of been superseded by the fact that we can just write new, make new repositories where adding issues like flows cred for a certain purpose. Um, but right now we're not actually incorporating the source cred slash mission uh, cred graph very well into the overall source cred cred. Uh, so I'm not... Uh, I'm not sure that I totally understand what you mean. Like, mm. if we want to add new nodes to the graph, we can create new repositories. But if, like, some contributor who doesn't have repo create access wants to do that, but they should still be able to, like, spotlight someone for helping them on a pull request, is that, like, how does that fit in? Well, I mean, if they want to spotlight someone for helping them on a pull request, they could just have that pull request say, like, thanks, so-and-so, in the pull request body. Okay. So is the idea that... Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess I, I should have picked an example of it. Is, is the idea that there aren't any examples that don't fit into the existing structure? No, you're totally right. I mean, I guess it's it's kind of like one way for this to happen is that a repo uh, could, a project could create like a catch-all, like a spotlights repo. And then you just post an issue in that right. repo being like, thanks so-and-so for helping me with XYZ and create the references. Yeah, um, that, that feels like a particular implementation of the ability for people to add arbitrary nodes to the graph. Right. And Bear is asking whether that's the best implementation, if that's something that we want to do. Yeah, that's a, that's a good framing. Um, but I think it also, like, it kind of surfaces, right now we just don't have good tools for integrating cred across multiple repositories. Uh, and that's something I think is, is pretty high priority to add. Maybe we should. Right. And, and the thing is that it's not totally, it's not totally stacked out how that should work from a design perspective. Uh, like, I feel like in some sense, like getting, I, I would like to be able to ask the question, who has source cred implementation cred? Who has source cred like logistics cred based on like the contributions from both repositories? But then it's like, how does it spill over if like my pull request thanks your, the office hours, because the office hours like suggested a pull, a change, then the person who in that, that like logistics issue earns like implementation cred and like just the semantics there are hard to figure out exactly. Um, and I think doing that the principled way requires some really like like sophisticated changes to the page rank algorithm where you're moving these like vectors rather than scalars on the edges. Uh, but doing it really simplistically, you know, there's maybe these interesting simplistic things you can do where you go and say, okay, I'm going to assign a weight on the uh, source cred slash logistics repo and I'm going to assign a weight on the source cred slash source cred repo. And I can get your total cred by just running page rank with that graph. And if I want to get your logistics cred, I just set the weight on the implementation repo to be really low and the weight on the logistics repo to be really high. 
And now I like heuristically have your logistics cred. It just doesn't have nice properties in the sense that we don't have any guarantee about how, you know, whether adding your logistics cred and your implementation cred has anything to do with your overall cred, you know? Yeah, I think it definitely doesn't. It doesn't have those nice properties that you right. want. Um, like there, there is a sense in which the person, I don't know, like this, this is a, an assertion, but there, there's a sense in which the person who has the most implementation cred, if they come in and like thumbs up your logistics issue, that, that should still mean something. And just setting the implementation weight to zero doesn't feel like the right thing to me. I don't know. Yeah. But, but it can't mean everything at the same time. I, I don't know what the right solution is. Yeah. I know this kind of gets back to case studies. One of the kinds of case study I've been interested in having is like little micro graphs or like just build really small like toy situations. And then we can use those to reason about what should the semantics be there and like what are the semantics given our current algorithm. Um, I agree with that a lot because it's, it's somewhat difficult currently to understand how the credit flows. Like if I look at a list of my pull requests, for example, um, and there was like, like uh, Will posted a link to another uh, a website that does a little bit of like, they had a stat that was like uh, in someone's profile, like they were like an 85% top tier JavaScript developer on GitHub. But I had no context on how they arrived at that number. And as such, I don't know what it means. And I, think, I feel like we have a little bit of that problem so long as people are, you know, don't understand how the cred flows and those toy algorithms or the toy graphs would go a long way, I think. Right. Yeah. I think this is one thing where once, uh, my page rank graph, uh, code load lands, mm -hmm. uh, we could use that to build one of these like toy graph editors and just try to make it easy to like construct a simple graph in the UI yeah. and then like see how the cred flows across it. You know, things with like 15 nodes or fewer. Uh, and I think that that might be helpful. How do you guys feel about like when you look at your pull requests on the current website? Like, how do you feel about how accurate the graph, the source code algorithm is? It's a good question. And incidentally, you know, we were talking about doing case studies. The first case study we should do is source code on source code. Uh, but here, let me let me try to share screen, and um, I can just talk about it. And William, uh, who is going to be in a lot of these pull requests, can chime along. Uh, this is, I think this is relatively old. We haven't, I don't think we've updated this sourcegrad.io site in a while, which we should probably do that. Uh, and it's missing sourcegrad slash mission, but this will still be looking at a lot of the historical stuff. So if we, if we go and look at, let's just look at the pull requests. Uh, create the GitHub graph. I think that's a genuinely a quite important pull request. Uh, load commit authorship from GitHub is not particularly important. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's like a fine pull request, but there's no way that it should be in the top, like, I don't think it should be in the top 10% by pull request. So this is like a false positive. Uh, add documentation to the graph module. I don't, I mean, from a documentation perspective, it's very important. From an implementation perspective, it's not important at all. Uh, so I think that's like, this, this is just because it was something that so many people put reviews on because it's like, you know, it gets the, it's kind of a more of a bike shed, you know? Uh, I mean, it's a good bike shed, but it's yeah. got the same kind of property and that it's accessible to comment on. So it gets a lot of credit for that reason. I think that one in particular had a bunch of single comment reviews because if you click add single comment, that actually creates a whole review entity in GitHub's ontology. Yeah. So it's kind of a bug. Um, implement core aggregation logic. I think that's actually a fairly important one. Uh, it's not as important as like implement page rank, but it's pretty important. And then you have some that are like disabled to Git plugin. Like this just should not, this is a super unimportant PR. So yeah, I would say right now the, the quality of source cred on its own pull requests is uh, you know uneven at best. Uh, and can we, we take a look at issues? I think you might have some better signal there. Yeah, let's take a look at issues. And we we don't take in, we don't take into account the number of code lines changed at all. Do you guys just like not believe in that? I have no opinion of my own. I would say that it kind of gets messed up when you do like like have node modules and stuff when it's just a lot of uh, functions that kind of don't get used or it just kind of get like auto generated. So it's not necessarily like a, like is that from when you import a library or something? I don't. Yes and no. Um, it depends on like what, like <clears throat> what things you want kind of to like, 
for node modules, like you usually have that as like a git ignore, but um, I don't know when you when you like auto generate things, there's like lots of just small it also yeah. doesn't large amounts of code that because it's also I, I, I get what you're saying, but it's also like not a bad heuristic either, is it? Like if you contribute five hundred lines, that's usually more valuable than ten, right? If the pull request gets committed, if the maintainers bless it and say it's worthwhile, I mean it's usually more, right? I, I think I agree, but only in terms of like if they are positively correlated. I like I, I think uh -huh. there's probably a pretty weak positive correlation, and that some of the most important like bug fixes, or if you think about it, certainly in terms of effort. You know, mm -hmm. I can I can spend a week tracking down a bug that is a three line of code change, and in fact, I mm -hmm. did that a couple weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. So and and it also like if you take as a heuristic that more lines of code is better, then that has like really bad incentives for what kinds of code you write, right? Um, and then there's also like deletions. We generally think of deleting code as good. And mm -hmm. in fact, people usually say like, if you can write the same uh, commit in less code, that's probably good. Or if you have more test code, that's probably good. So there's like, there's a lot of, of competing factors here. There's yeah. But I, I do agree that I, it's I think possible, yeah. I was going to say that that question of like how much energy and difficulty the pull request has in it too is kind of interesting because, you know, all things given equal, if you have, you know, five pull requests and you're comparing them, the hardest one should get the most cred probably because other people couldn't have done it. And that's just also an interesting question to me is like how, and that's something that the maintainers usually know better than anyone else is like, how difficult was this, right? Because. So I, I have a number of things to add to this, this discussion. Uh, one is on the waiting code by waiting the value of pull request by the lines of code. Uh, in the earliest, you know, if you go back to the very beginning of SourceGrad's development history, like the first few Git commits, you'll find that before there was any of this JavaScript project at all, there was like an IPython notebook that William and I were hacking on, and that IPython notebook did like weight things by lines of code. It actually weighted by the logarithm of the number of lines of code changed, which proved to be a better metric. Uh, and so I actually, I do favor having like metrics like this because I do think that like uh, William said, I think they're positively correlated and they add some signal. Uh, the real issue is that we we have not yet come up with a uh, effective, like a, a principled mathematical system for being able to combine many different heuristics on nodes. Uh, we still need to like document exactly why we had trouble with this. But basically what we found is that when we were trying to add heuristics, those nodes that had more heuristics defined for them would tend to categorically get more cred. So if I defined like 10 heuristics on pull requests and only two heuristics on issues, it would mean that pull requests would get a lot more cred just because there was so much more signal on them. And that seemed like a weird dynamic. Uh, but I do want to add, I do want to add the heuristics like that pull commits that change more code are in general like correlated with being more valuable. But I want to weigh that out by having a lot of different heuristics as well. Uh, and I think one one class of heuristics, rather than just looking at the absolute lines of code, looking at like the cyclomatic complexity of the code, uh, I guess William, William had to leave, uh, but looking at like the cyclomatic complexity of the code, looking at how this code is actually involved in the call graph. So you know, if I write 50 lines of code that never actually get called, that has a very much less credit, but if I write like 50 lines of code that are actually in like the heart of the code base uh, from a dependency standpoint, that would be a lot more valuable. Um, I think also this like having the maintainer assess the difficulty of a pull request is also a really interesting idea. Um, back when I was in Google, this was how part of how they did the promotion process was they wanted to promote you based on doing work that was like genuinely difficult work, you know. And I think as you said, maintainers are in a good position to assess that. And so I think one system we could imagine having is maybe like a Chrome plugin where a maintainer can for every pull request label it as like you know, a one to three point scale on like how difficult this was from like trivial to like very hard and how important was it from like trivial, you know, fixed a typo in the readme to like very important. Yeah, and, and, and also we were talking about this last time though, but labels would be really useful too. If, if, a, if a repo uses labels and it's labeled hard, then that right. is, is actually the clear sign of difficult, you know, you could have. Yeah, and this would be one of the, one of the earliest heuristics we could maybe add is just like setting a weight on different labels so that yeah. Yeah, we could probably do that pretty soon. That would not be that yeah. far off. Yeah, actually, if we, if we, um, I think what would be really cool is if like we could make the weight slider give every label a weight, you know? So I can just like say, okay, 
I want the hard label to have a weight of four. I want the like bug label to have a weight of two. Uh, and I think that would give a very like rich and meaningful like set of dials to turn. Um, but it's, it's like not trivial how to build that. Uh, mm -hmm. The first thing would, of course, just be to get the labeled data from GitHub. So it's like pretty clear how to start that. Uh, and yeah, Brian, if you want to work on that, I would be super excited to see that. How out. how hard is it like like when when things are deleted? I guess right now when we we don't have a system in place to like update the graph, we only basically just like topple the whole thing and re-download the whole thing when we need to create so a new we graph. Do no, we do actually update. That's the whole mirror module that we were discussing at the beginning. Basically, we like oh, okay. keep like a local copy of everything in the GitHub history. Uh, and then as there's more stuff, we like add it to our local copy. Uh, I don't think that we handle deletions. Uh, but the good news is that for labels, we don't actually. So I believe that GitHub provides labeling as a stream of labeling events. So the labeling events never get deleted. They just like accumulate where there's like an event, like I labeled the issue foo, that's an event. And then I unlabeled the issue foo, that's another event. And so by looking at the history of the events, we could okay. uh, get the current label mapping. Okay. Um, but I think that when you, if we think about it from like the heuristic standpoint, like let's say that we wanted to have a slider and we could change the weight on every issue that was tagged hard. Uh, it's, it's not clear if the way that we should do that is by putting a high weight on the, the label node. So we could have a label node that points to every issue that is labeled. And so then the label node could flow cred to every, every uh, issue that it got the label. And I think that would actually be the wrong implementation because that would mean, let's say that I, had a, I made an issue that has like no yeah. content and never got referenced, but I just get it labeled bug. Then it will like get some of the, like, the bug cred. Uh, okay. uh, and so that, that's kind of weird, right? It's like every time I make a new issue that's labeled bug, it's sort of like stealing cred from every other bug issue. That just, that seems like a bug. Uh, but we also, the way that the weights work in the PageRank algorithm is that if a node has a high weight, uh, then it kind of is like more like, it's got like higher gravity, like it, any cred, any nodes that it's connected to, it's more likely to get cred from them. Uh, and so if we imagine that like, let's say that I've reacted to two issues. Uh, I've reacted to the hard issue and the easy issue. If the hard issue has a higher weight, then more of my cred will flow on along my reaction to the hard issue than to the easy issue because it's just like more weighty in general. And so I think that as we're thinking about changing, um, you know, being able to like kind of give priority based on labels, that's actually more what we want to do is changing the weight of that node. Uh, yeah. But that's not exactly the way that the architecture was designed. We made it really easy to like add new nodes and edges to the graph and it's harder to add new weights to the graph. And that's kind of the heuristics problem I alluded to. Okay. Um, so I think what I'll say is that if you're interested in working on this, uh, we could like schedule a whole another meeting and just like it could, you know, another public meeting, but just like dive into like the, the specific oh, details sure. there yeah. of how the algorithm works and what the trade-offs are. Yeah, uh, I think that would also just be pretty useful. Like, like if we were to have that meeting, I think what I would do first is I would go and prepare like a little like document just describing the algorithm and describing the problem, and then we could like go over it together. And that would also be great because that would be starting to build out the like research. You know, we need to have these like documents explaining how the algorithm works and how we're planning to extend it. So, well, um, I've been looking at just like the PageRank Wikipedia page, and mm -hmm. they have this like pretty nice. Um, analogy of like the random surfer right that makes mm -hmm. complete sense to me you know right. what is the analogy in source cred yeah so i would say that it's kind of like <laughs> i mean maybe it's like a random random snowboarder um <laughs> so you do have so at the core so at the core we have the same idea of page rank which is that yeah you can imagine this random surfer and the random surfer starts at some random node in the graph and then they surf around uh, on these edges and each edge kind of the edges have a directionality to them so if for example i react thumbs up to your post the random surfer is very likely to go from me to your post but very unlikely to go from your post to me because the directionality of the reaction edge is almost always almost all like from the user to the thing being reacted to to the post yeah uh, and then the weight, it's kind of like every every uh, node in the graph has its own like internal elevation to an extent. 
And when oh, a surfer yeah. is considering where to go, it's like more likely to go downhill than uphill. Like it can sometimes go uphill. Maybe it's more like a skier than a snowboarder. You know, they do sometimes go uphill, but they prefer to go downhill. Uh, and mm. so that is how like when I, when you go and like in the weight configuration and change the weight on issues to be higher, you're kind of making every issue more downhill. So it's more likely that the surfer will randomly surf to those nodes. Do I have it right that, you know, these, the, the, the edges leading out of a node are a probability distribution based on the weight of each edge? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's right. And, and so essentially what it is, it's a probability distribution based on the weight of the edge times the weight of the node. Uh, there you go. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Which is why, like, if I go and take some particular node and I increase its weight, then, in effect, every incoming edge became a little bit stronger uh, because it's like a strong edge. You know, it's, it's whatever weight of the edge times the weight of that particular node. Very good. So that'd be a bit of a tangent, but uh, is any thoughts on like negative cred? So it's like if we have, say, a node in the graph that's like maybe a comment by a bot that's like, hey, you did something wrong. Um, right. So right now we don't have a way to express negative cred. Uh, it's not clear exactly in the PageRank algorithm. So the PageRank algorithm assigns a probability, probability distribution over the nodes. And you know, probability distributions don't have negative terms. Uh, so I think that to get really negative cred, we would need to be doing something that's fundamentally different. But I think if what you want is you want the ability for a bot to flag a comment as being like, this was a bad comment, you maybe have the ability to do that through the weight system. So maybe you could go and say, OK, you know, my, this, my, my you know, bot bad heuristic for weight is that any post that was flagged by the bot gets its weight cut in half. And then that means that whatever else was in the post is going to get less cred from every connection because its weight was lower. I almost feel like with pull requests, like I feel like the nature of um, a lot of GitHub projects is that like the maintainers are resource and time constrained because it's not the thing they do all the time. It's like their side project. And so right. I feel like the most relevant place where you would want to detract cred, and this is not how it works right now, but is like, is when the maintainer has to spend a lot of time with you on your pull request, right? <laughs> because he could be doing other things and he's spending time on you with yours. And when you're, when he's got like, you know, 10 hours a week, let's say to work on the, the, the that's, repo. An, that's interesting. You say that because right now the dynamic would be the opposite Yeah. because the more that the maintainer interacts with a given item, the more credit accumulates. And like, there's a sense in which there's, there's like a, an intuitive rationale for that too, which is that like, if whatever pull request you did was important enough that the maintainer is going and spending a bunch of their time like engaging with you on it, then maybe that's, that's a signal true. that you contributed something really valuable. Uh, that's also true, actually. I, I would actually agree with that too. There is that element of it as well. Yeah. Now, one thing that I think could be valuable is like uh, putting more emphasis on the uh, reactions rather than just the engagement. And so like I've, I've tried to make an effort uh, or make a point within source cred of reacting thumbs up to comments that I think like, oh, that was like particularly valuable, you know? Uh, and to the extent that maintainers are consistently doing that, then, you know, if I'm just engaging with you because you're making a lot of noise and I have to keep on like telling you to like fix your lint errors or whatever, then I'm not going to be thumbs up in your pull request a lot, even if I do engage with it a lot. And so that might be a way to distinguish those cases. But it, of course, makes you know potential gaming or potential like bad feelings. You know, I never if someday people in the source code project are coming and complaining to me in Discord, being like, "You didn't thumbs up my post that was actually really good," then that'll be a face palm for me. I feel like that's also very like very kind of project and like habit dependent, where it's like people get in the habit of like doing things a bunch, and um, if you kind of like make a heuristic around that and like this other project or people just don't follow that kind of system, then that kind of just like, it, it, it takes away the, the signal that you're getting there and maybe it's like putting it elsewhere perhaps. I don't know. I was thinking about that today too, how like these projects are also like, they're very specific in how the people behave within a project. Like they're different. This is different from any other project I've seen or worked on and how that's, 
one reason why the flexibility of source credit, the ability to set your own weights and stuff is super important, I think. I think Daniel Einlick has been alluding to that and it didn't quite hit home with me, but that these projects are all kind of different. Like they're going to have, we are talking about like uh, tagging an issue when you, when you do a new release, right? Like some projects are going to do that and some projects are not. And that's why the flexibility concept is really important. Yeah, plus wanting that, I think that's why I like, like making it easy for users to write custom heuristics uh, will be really valuable because then you can capture the different heuristics of a project. Uh, I also think that if source cred, like, like if source cred makes it really easy to give cred by following X, Y, and Z pattern and has like good tools for that, uh, that will encourage people to change their behaviors as well. You know, because like the UIs that people build then change behavior as a consequence. That's a really interesting concept too, I think, is how we can also like on the other side of that is encourage people to do things that are beneficial to the project that they wouldn't have done if they didn't have the incentive in place. Like that's, in fact, to me as an individual contributor, looking at the um, current source credit implementation, that is one of the things that strikes me as the most immediately valuable is if you could, if you could give me signal on the quality of my contributions, I could change my behavior to be, to be more valuable, right? Use my energy better. Right. So one way in which the, I think the algorithm has already done that for me is uh, in doing development work on source cred, I've been pretty proactive in like linking my issues to the related pull requests and linking my pull requests to the related issues and in general, like kind of creating this like web of connections. And that's in part because there is an incentive to do so because like if we look, oh, I guess I'm actually still screen sharing. That's funny. Um, if we look at the issues, like why is this one the most important? It's the most important because it got referenced by so many pull requests. Uh, why is this one so important? It got referenced by a bunch of pull requests. And I think that's actually like a good thing. Like I think it's helpful that I can go here and see all the, you know, it's got a bunch of contacts and I can go and read all the pull requests that use this and like then start to like fit things together. Uh, you know, here's like, okay, milestone. Here's all the pull requests that referenced it. Um, so I think that's already like one degree of like changed behavior. Um, yeah. And I think that we, as we build more tools like that, it can be useful. Yeah, I think like another uh, thing about that though is kind of the, the, the feedback loop. So it's like, it, it's, it's nice if you kind of like look at the, the, that like explore a lot, but if you never check that, then it kind of like, it doesn't like reinforce the habit. So I think kind of like yep. getting the kind of like, small bits of um okay if if you kind of have a, a command line thing that will say it's like oh you got x amount of cred for like making a commit i think that kind of like helps reinforce that system like even more um yeah and that, that's why i think like part of uh this back end redesign of graphql like that sort of stuff is uh important just because like this allows for kind of these very modern like real time um, things that like Facebook was that is building upon for like how they do like notifications and state management and the that is very like reactive in real time. And so mm -hmm. it's like if you can do that where it's like it, if like data from GitHub flows to here and then gives you like I don't know Chrome extension or something that will like just explode like uh, coins or something that like gives you that that feedback loop. I think that kind of like also is just like habit reinforcing for like this. I agree with that like 100% that that would be awesome. Yeah. I also think that on the other hand, it would also be super cool in the, the concept of time-based cred if you could kind of see things that you did. If you work super hard on a pull request and you know it's not going to explode in your, you know, immediately, it's not going to, but it's going to be super valuable over time. I think you've talked about this too, Dandelion. If you can promote yeah. behavior that's going to impact the, repo over the long term as opposed to prioritizing short term stuff too. Both of those are super would be super cool. Yeah, I, I totally agree that we should uh, get a tighter feedback loop. And right now it's like, it's incredibly slow, right? I think that even just doing it uh, week to week, like if we produce these weekly notes, like I think this is something we'll suggest in the original issue, like also putting like a weekly like cred update would be great. Um, and yeah, also figuring out how, like, if your old pull request has become a lot more valuable, how do we go and give you a sense of, like, satisfaction today being like, oh, yeah, now that that pull is getting used, like, I've earned more cred for that. 
Um, but yeah, basically strong agree. We need to figure out how to do it exactly. And I definitely uh, agree that we should tighten that feedback cycle. Also related to like time-based cred, um, I guess how, how might that work if it's like, okay, this project is trying to focus on like issues at the moment. And so they kind of like wait this year and you do a bunch of stuff and you get like X amount of crowd cred, but then they kind of change focus and then they like shift the weights towards something else. And then if that shifts, then that kind of takes away your cred. Like how, how might right. that work? I guess. Like, so the way that I've always imagined the, that kind of weighting of like short-term prioritization working would be through grain rather than cred per se. So like ideally we would go and say, okay, you know, this week we're really focused on issues. We want to close our open issues. So we're going to configure source cred for this week to reflect the a high issue prioritization. And then we'll go and give you grain for that week. And then that's like the token that kind of stays with you. So even if we go and change the weighting next week, you still have all the grain you earned for the stuff that you did we valued this week. Um, Brian, is, is grain, have I mentioned grain to you? Have we talked about this? I've read, I've read about it. It actually makes, okay, cool. it kind of actually completes the, it's very important, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, I think so too. Um, yeah. How could we help the flow team? Aren't they like struggling with open source, their open source community? Oh, um, man. That's a good, I really like that question. Maybe we should ask, you know, we apparently have one of the flow people in our Discord, right? Because he. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can ask like, how can we? We should we could just run source cred on flow and then sort of see yeah. like, hey, how can we use this to help you? Man, that's a really good idea. I like that. One thing I was also I have in this like list of uh, issues to to bring up is kind of just like, I guess random metrics of stuff. So it's like, okay, how how can you like look at the state of a project and see kind of like the, the the state of it sort of, and then look at this state like a week from now and kind of see what's changed and. I think this would be useful where it's like, okay, this pr it's, look at a project that's like using source cred now, see like, I guess how that might help these metrics kind of either grow or change or see if there's kind of like any sort of, of difference there. Um, I, I think there is, I, I saw in my GitHub feed, like uh, someone at IPFS was doing something that, like this too. Uh, just like, cause now, now on GitHub, they like give you this option of being able to download pretty much everything from a repository and you could like, do stuff like like you could kind of analyze it like that but mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's kind of like useful for just like determining growth or impact or um. yeah I think also like this is something that open collective has, has asked for because uh, they want the ability they like send out these like monthly like updates to the backers of a project and they were like man we'd really love to be able to send out this monthly update that's kind of auto generated with like what's the major activity been who have the new contributors been um, so I, I agree that this would be interesting and also pretty useful if we wanted to like, like this A could be something that like is a reason to use source cred while the cred algorithm is still like kind of immature in that like getting these updates would be useful and interesting and it's easy, relatively easy for us to do given the data pipeline that we have. Yeah. That, yeah, that's an interesting question. It feels like, um, well, there is this distinction and these repos, like how much, like that's like a world facing thing. Like how much value is, or is the repo providing to the rest of the world? Versus yeah, that's much, a really hard one to answer. Yeah. That, that's like the other, that's like in terms of metrics and stuff versus I feel like we're in a really good position to um, say how give internal metrics, but the rest of the world facing metrics is an interesting question. Yeah, so in principle, we have, I think that the same tool and like so tools and like core concepts of source cred could be reapplied to the sort of world facing one. Because uh, you could imagine like we could make an NPM plugin and the NPM plugin has a node for every NPM package and an edge for every dependency in the package graph. And then you could go and oh, see, that's okay. That's a really go, good idea. Yeah, then you could say Lodash has a ton of cred in this like meta like JavaScript graph because it has so many edges pointing to Lodash from so many other projects. Because one of the one of the things I was thinking about, like, uh, is that if you ever were actually incentive, like paying people with Bitcoin for their contributions, people would just run to the most valuable repos, wouldn't they? They would just all go work on the ones that were paying the most, right? Yeah, presumably. <laughs> um, 
And so, like, I think, you know, if you did this, if you could set up the, the the incentives right, and then it meant, like, a ton of people want to go and work on, like, NumPy and, like, Python and, uh, you know, all the other, like, core in open source infrastructure, uh, that, that would be pretty cool. That would be, yeah. That's, that's kind of the goal, you know. That's, like, the dream, right? Yeah. Exactly. Nice. Yeah, one thing that I think an interesting experiment to run would be um, kind of having issues on source cred, but placing, like, Gitcoin bounties on them and just kind of like seeing what happens like seeing like okay do people actually start to contribute to this like do they stick around after they do a bounty like um, yeah I think there's kind of like a little like some something to to, to figure out there like because because I've seen like when someone places a bounty on a, like a project like someone jumps on it like within an hour of like that bounty being posted like I, I've never seen that happen for just random issues before so right yeah, this is something I've talked to uh, Kevin from Gitcoin a couple times about that. Uh, and yeah, I'm at the time it, well, like, we didn't have that many like issues when I was last time. We didn't have that many issues that were like really good things to bounty, but uh, now I think we do. Um, so I would definitely be interested in that experiment. But I think like just just the small things though, just like, like literally make specific issues that are simple things to solve and just put like twenty dollars on or like things that are like mm. trivial, like just to kind of see if like people are interested right yeah yeah maybe maybe we could go and like uh i i could go and like get us like a thousand dollars of funding or this for this and then we could go and look at the uh not, we could we could have an office hour where we go look at the contributions welcome and let's see which ones we'd want to give small bounties to i'm uh, not Brian? familiar i'm not that familiar with bitcoin is are there any like legal like hurdles you have to jump through to pay people it's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> it's just magic internet money. Because there's like iOS apps that I could just like you could charging people really easily on the iOS store, and you could just say, "This is look, we're gonna we're gonna pay our contributors on source credit. It wouldn't be that hard. When you have the pipe, when you have like an iOS app that has a has a pre built um, mechanism to charge people. Hmm. sorry i missed that are you saying that there'd be like an open source ios app and then it would like pay the contributors yeah because it's like, so easy to charge people whatever. for an ios app you know you don't have to do anything you just put it on the store and then you could say look i'm gonna pay everyone in bitcoin that contributes but yeah i don't i would have reservations about how to i don't know how, how, do you have, like, I don't know actually how to execute that yeah yeah yeah, it's an interesting question. I think another a similar version of this would be to set up a project, open source project with a Patreon, and then say, yeah, I'm just going to like oh, give the money from go, the Patreon yeah. to everyone yeah. who yeah. contributes. That would actually, you know, that's a pretty good idea, though, to think of like really easy ways to start testing this with like small sums of money. I guess that's what Will was essentially saying. But it, th think about like really easy ways to test this stuff. Like even if you were only charging people a dollar for access to a silly website and it only makes $100, you still could distribute it, you know, and you still could yeah. see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be neat. I just I like, like low cost it. ways to do it, you know, not like it wouldn't have to be anything super intense, but something you could spin up pretty quick. Yeah, and this is something that also could come from the uh the Patreon or sorry, not Patreon, the open collective integration. Uh, because they've got, you know, once a project is on open collective, they like have money to distribute. So mm -hmm. I think a project could go and say, Okay, we're gonna give like five percent of our of our like revenue from open collective just according to source cred. Then that would give us mm -hmm. some data on how it works. Yeah. Um, so we're almost at the end of the hour. Uh, I feel like we have indeed like talked about a ton of cool stuff. Um, I think I'll probably try to schedule another another one of these office hours for like another two weeks from now, maybe. Uh, and I'll just like use the Discord to coordinate. Um, Brian, I'm wondering when you make the notes for this mm -hmm. uh, this meeting, and I'll send you the recording soon. Uh, would you be willing to just post like a, a bunch of these ideas from the office hours where like kind of actionable like feature ideas and such? Uh, would you be willing to post issues on source cred and just kind of link back to the office hours and to the right like time yeah. stamp? And then yeah, we can that's no problem at all. Yeah, and then we can we can kind of develop out like I think that this like labels idea is a super valuable one. So if you are interested in hacking on that, uh, we can like spend some more time talking about it. Yeah, we could also we should we could um, pair program something next week if you wanted an activity. Yeah. Um, because I gotta say that uh, 
that deep dive, that coding we did, it was four hours long. That's pretty hard to consume, honestly. <laughs> if you want people to, well, I mean, yeah. it was, it was, it was, it's, it was difficult. Um, but if me and you went in and worked on something for like 45 minutes, it might be, it might be easier to consume. Also, like, how do you guys feel about just like blasting out these YouTube vids and stuff on Twitter? I don't know how to, I don't actually oh. know any other strategies, but like, that's how I, that's how I get you. That's how I consume or get news Ryan, about. Do you like, want to, do you want to help run the source cred Twitter? <laughs> I've not, I, I got on Twitter like I, literally five months ago. So I don't, I mean, yeah, I'm me too. I'm, I'm, not, to, I'm not like an expert. Yeah, I'm I'm not a Twitter expert either, but I, we do have a source cred Twitter, so I could just share the uh, the login with you, and you can help us uh, help us do that. I could just, I would just, I'd be happy to just. I know a few people that are. I guess the React team is really good at it. Actually, I see a lot of React stuff on Twitter, and sort of just copy what they do, maybe. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. All right. Yeah, and I, I do like the idea of pair programming. Maybe we could even just. I love scheduling things synchronously whenever it's possible. You know. Uh, so if you want to do like next uh, like Thursday, I think that could work for me. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know. I like I said. I told you I I get a work schedule on like Saturday for Monday okay. through. Actually, I get a work schedule on Friday or Saturday for like Sunday through Saturday. Got so it. It might be. Okay. Like, I might have to give you a late notice. But, yeah. Let's um, let's just let's just check in next week then. But I, I do like the yeah. idea of uh, of doing that. I know we've talked about it. Yeah. And. Um, because I yeah, think these, I think these, like what we're like the content that you're generating is like super valuable, and I think that people will eventually, if given the chance, they will, they will see it retroactively, right? They'll see hmm. it. They might not see it like when you post it on Twitter, but they will see in a month that you have this backlog of stuff, and yeah, we're going to develop like a really good like FAQ, and it's going to be, and it's going to like it was to me when I looked at saw the office hours vid. It's going to be attractive to new contributors when they see how open we are and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. So I'll I'll make a to do on my end of like sharing the uh, cool. the Twitter ACLs with you. Yeah, we should think about that. Yeah. Um, and will yeah, I'd love to see like as far as like I still really like we're still in the situation right now where um, source cred doesn't reliably just work on large repositories because of the uh, the GitHub inconsistent node type thing. Um, so I definitely still really want a solution to that. Uh, totally open to the idea of exploring solving that through like adopting some off the shelf technology rather than through like adding more complexity to our mirror module. Uh, yeah, I've actually, I've tried both, both approaches and I have like a bunch of, bunch of things to say about that, but I could follow up with you, uh, after this or another time. But. Cool. Sounds, sounds good. Yeah, if you want to just schedule some time to like chat about this, uh, super down. Especially yeah, later later next week would be great because like the rest of this week is SBC and then uh, moving to Colorado. Cool. cool. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end this meeting then. Thank you all for coming to Source Code Second Office Hours, and Brian, I'll send you this video. Sure. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Will. It's a pleasure. Cheers, all. Cheers.